Good evening, viewers. Thanks for joining me on Resource PNG. Lined up tonight, we speak to the Asian Development Bank, ADB, Institute of National Affairs, and the World Bank. But now let's join Nicole with country economist, Mr. Aaron Batten from ADB, for an overview of PNG's economic outlook. Good evening, viewers. Tonight on Resource PNG, we have Asian Development Bank, the country economist, Mr. Aaron Batten, here in the studio. Good evening to you. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Okay, we brought you on to discuss about the recent um, research that you've done on the economic growth expected to fall in 2013. What is the economic outlook for PNG or what are coming years? Mm. Well, the latest round of forecasting undertaken by the ADB shows that the outlook for PNG is broadly positive still, but with some risks emerging in the economy. Um, we expect economic growth this year to be about 7.5%, which is down from 8.9% last year. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be a result of LNG construction continuing to boost economic activity, as well as strong growth in the agriculture sectors and the spillovers of these two activities into wholesale and retail trade. Okay. Looking further forward though, and we do expect to see a large moderation in growth for 2013. Um, with the ADB forecast of 4.5% growth in that year, which is well below the rates recorded in previous years. Okay, so why do you think the economic growth is expected to fall in 2013? There's a number of drivers underlying this um, moderating GDP growth. Um, the first and most important one is will be the winding down of construction of the LNG project. And this will lead to a big drop off in activities for the construction sector in particular, but also with spillovers into other sectors of the economy like transport, aviation and shipping services, yes. as well as wholesale and retail trade again. Further into the future too, we expect to see a slowing of growth in the agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. And this is largely because they will start to be negatively impacted from PNG's high exchange rate, which is reducing their international competitiveness. So what will this mean for Papua New Guinea? In the very short term, it might, might lead to a moderation in employment growth. Um, in 2013, but the demand for labour in the PNG economy is still very high, particularly for semi and skilled labour. Um, over the 2013 period, we also expect to see a moderation in price growth in inflation, which should help to protect um, incomes from rising prices, which reached about 10% last year. ADB's forecasts are for inflation to be 7% this year and then to further decline next year down to 6%. We're also starting to see some significant progress in the housing market with a, with a decline or sort of levelling off in prices for um, housing accommodation costs, particularly in Port Moresby and in Ley as well. Okay. So how can the government ensure that enough funding is allocated uh, to key service deliveries, priorities like health, education and um, infrastructure in the country? Well, this, be, this will be one of the major consequences of the slowdown in growth and that is an expected decline in government revenue over the next two to three years. This will be as a result of slowing growth, but also of the winding down of a number of mining and oil operations which exist in the country. And this will place increasing pressure on the government to be able to fund what is an increasing list of expenditure commitments that they've made, including free education and free health, as well as commitments made to the LNG equity stake um, and one-off election costs that they face. So protecting service delivery in this environment will be difficult. But we do believe that the government, with its low levels of public debt, has the ability to borrow over the short to medium term to continue funding those priority service delivery activities. And how can the government help create more job opportunities when this happens? So one of the key features of the last, what has now been a decade of economic growth in PNG has been sustained growth in employment creation. And this has led to a burgeoning middle class in PNG, which is having big effects on many sectors of the economy. One of the problems, however, though, is that this employment growth has tended to remain quite siloed in specific sectors of the economy, including the resources sector and in agriculture. And we haven't seen that broader income creation in other sectors of the economy. Um, and for that reason, the private sector has not been able to absorb PNG's rapidly expanding population. And recent estimates that we've made show that less than 10% of the PNG working age population are engaged in the formal private sector. So stimulating private sector employment growth has to be a major priority for government. Okay. Um, to do that, we highlight a number of things in our most recent report, including reducing the costs of doing business, promoting foreign investment, and also introducing competition into key sectors of the economy, like power and financial services. 
Now, the government has recently passed the organic law on sovereign wealth fund management. Mm. What will be the impact of this and how will it benefit PNG? Mm. Well, in our view, the sovereign wealth fund is a very good first step in ensuring that the revenues accruing from the LNG project, as well as all the other mining and, and energy projects going on in PNG, are able to leverage into service delivery for the people of PNG. But in that frame of mind, um, it is a first step towards those goals. Um, the broader goals of improving public financial management still need to be obtained um, for the PNG government to really be able to translate mining wealth into services for the people. With this economic growth expected to fall, just give a clarity on how it will affect the industries, mm. especially when we have this boom in oil and um, gas in the country, mm. the gas industries in the country. Well, the effects of moderating growth will be quite different across different sectors of the economy, obviously. Um, the winding down of LNG construction will actually probably be quite a positive impact on other mining and energy projects in the country. Um, the end of the construction phase will release a lot of capacity into the economy for skilled labour. People like engineers and other skilled technicians related to that project will be looking for other sources of employment, um, as well as freeing up things like transport services and port services. So we should see positive benefits for other resource development projects during that period as that winds down. The flow through effects to other sectors of the economy, however, could be quite detrimental. We we're likely to see a lowering in demand for, for transport services and wholesale and retail trade, which might lower income growth in those sectors. Okay. Now, do you have any advice you're willing to give to the people of Papua New Guinea on how to, how to just help them prepare for this uh, expected economic growth fall in 2013? Mm. Okay. Well, I think like at the national level, um, sensible long-term fiscal management is always the best strategy for addressing these sorts of challenges. I think fortunately for the people of Papua New Guinea, they're now having access to a range of financial services that were non-existent even four or five years ago. We've seen a dramatic increase in microfinance activities, in rural banking services and mobile banking services. And this is giving people not only in urban areas but in, in rural areas to access to facilities to save their money to be able to handle periods when, when income growth declines. Okay, good. Now, recently we've been like hearing in the newspaper that there's been uh, payments to the landowners for the funds or the land entitlements and all that. Mm. Is there uh, advice you could give to our viewers watching how they could manage these funds that they get? Well, this is obviously an issue for the government to deal with and a very tricky one at that. Um, as I mentioned, in, in terms of the public financial management reforms, it's just in, ensuring that these funds are done in an accountable and transparent way and that they actually are delivered to the types of projects that are meant to improve the living standards of people in the rural areas being affected by the mining projects. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time on the show. Thank you very much. You're watching Resource PNG. After the break, we join Executive Director of PNG Institute of National Affairs, Paul Barker. In 1988, he was appointed Special Advisor in the Prime Minister's Department, addressing particularly the economic sector and various governance issues, a post filled for 16 years until mid-2004, then becoming Technical Advisor with the European Delegation in the Solomon Islands until January 2006 to help develop and manage the major EU-funded post-conflict programs to Solomon Islands. Mr. Barker has been Executive Director of the Institute of National Affairs since January 2006. He has had a long involvement with various cultural and civil society organizations, including chairing the National Cultural Commission from 1994 to 2004 and the Research and Conservation Foundation of PNG. We now join Mr. Barker on the show to discuss his views on the partnership between Petrim and PNG Holdings and Shell in upstream exploration. Uh, two of the uh, global credit agency, credit rating agencies, there is another one uh, of significance, but these are two of the, the, the big ones. Credit ratings are given by these, these two companies to countries and to companies. 
and, uh, and you go from AAA, which means that you are a very, very secure country or company, and if someone invests in your country or company, you can expect to uh, have a, a very safe investment and uh, you're not going to lose the capital that you've put in there. So if you're lending to that country or lending to that company, you can expect to be able to get the money back. If you get a very low credit rating, then it's a very high risk. And what happens is to make up for that risk, you want to get a very, very good return. So you put a very high interest rate on that uh, on a, a loan to that country or company. So you're seeing at the moment, for example, in Europe, this European crisis, you've seen the credit rating for Greece and Italy going down, and in the last few days, uh, Spain's and, uh, and France's have gone down as well. It means that it has become harder for them to go and borrow on the international market for their country's uh, needs, but also for companies within those countries uh, it, it can make it harder for them to, to be borrowing as well. Now in Papua New Guinea, developing countries by and large have a higher risk factor than uh, most of the developed countries. So United States, very traditionally very safe. France, Japan, traditionally very safe. Uh, as I say, you've seen some of them just in, s in the last few years having a slight downgrading grading of their ratings. But Papua New Guinea, as one of the developing countries, generally considered to be a little bit more politically unstable. And so countries which have, for example, a uppity army that sometimes feels like having a coup, and where the investment in the country, where money is lent, for example, to the government, or is lent to a company in that country, where it is seen to be risky, because there may be a coup, or uh, there may be um, lots of chops and changes of government, which in itself isn't so bad, but it's if there are chops and changes in policies, in tax rates, in the rules. For example, you're going to change the rules and say, ah, you've got an investment in mining. Well, now, instead of the mine um, be long the resource belonging to the state, it now belongs to the landowners, or uh, and the agreement between the state and your company may be uh, not as valuable as it was before. These sorts of things raise the risk level and make it that much more expensive if a company is trying to borrow to develop a major project or if the government is trying to borrow. Now, the government here doesn't need to borrow. It's got reasonable revenue. Um, so in terms of government, it shouldn't have an immediate and direct impact, the fact that the, the risk has... has uh, been seen by these two credit agencies to have risen. But in terms of project financing for um, future LNG projects, for example, uh, the, the proposed one for Gulf and there may be a future one for, uh, for Western Province and, and offshore for some of the new proposed mining projects, but also for major new agricultural projects, the cost of borrowing um, would potentially go up somewhat because the the lender would see it as a little riskier to be lending to Papua New Guinea because of the uncertainty. Mr. Baka, you spoke earlier about, you gave an elaborate viewpoint of the PNG's economic growth in the resource sector. As opposed to the economic growth, the positive economic growth that the resource boom will bring, how effective do you think sustainable environmental practices have been? Environmental practices, Papua New Guinea is a pretty pristine country in terms of its natural resources. And we do depend on making sure that they remain pristine. We know we've had some problems. We've had uh, the disaster, if you like, of the uh, Okteri River uh, affecting livelihoods and the, uh, and the purity and, and, the, uh, and the river level and everything in the, uh, in the Okteri and Fly Rivers. We have had problems, of course, in, with Bougainville and the Jabba River. But by and large, uh, the reputation has, has been good, and we need that for many of our industries. The fisheries industry, for example, it depends upon, and we have a very large percentage of the global 
tuna industry it, based on PNG waters, that, that the fish are seasonally at least within Papua New Guinea's waters, and they're in the waters because of rich nutrients coming down off, off land and into the sea, providing the nutrients necessary for, for f marine life. Um, if we had polluted rivers, then that would jeopardize the offshore reefs, it would jeopardize the, uh, the life on those reefs, but also the life off the reefs, the tuna industry, and so on. We have a reputation for, for basically healthy food. We can get a premium on our, uh, on our cocoa. We can get a premium on our uh, coffee. We, the cocoa goes in what's called the fine and flavor market. We are increasingly moving into, for example, the fair trade and the, uh, and the green market for uh, organic food and, and generally green food based upon the reputation as a, as a healthy environment. We know that you have situations, for example, in China where there's vast populations intensively producing right next to major industries and we keep on getting these food scares coming out of China. PNG should be taking advantage of the opportunity to have its reputation for clean, healthy environment. And there's, we have to ensure that we don't jeopardize that with, uh, with damaging the environment from poorly managed extractive industries. So we've got to manage the tailings, the, the waste disposal from mines, whether they're onshore mines or, or whether, you know, the idea of tailings into, into marine areas. We have to be very careful with these sorts of things and their impact upon, upon the environment. Uh, but also uh, other industries do cause uh, environmental impacts and, and we have to sort of just safeguard the, the forestry industry as we know that uh, we have to make sure that these industries are sustainable, that we don't just harvest. We've got this situation now where we have what are being called these SABLs, and there's a commission of inquiry into SABLs. Suddenly, we're having a lot of project proposals which are not coming in as realistic proposals for you know, a 200 or a 500 or even a 5,000 hectare agricultural project. These are suddenly coming in saying, oh, we want 100,000 hectare. We know that there are no agricultural investors who are coming in wanting vast areas like that. You don't do it that way. You, whether you're talking about rice or oil palm, you develop incrementally. We now have something like 100,000 hectares of oil palm uh, in the country, which has been built up since the 1960s. It has a reputation for sustainable oil palm and meeting certain in social and environmental standards. We can't jeopardize that with a rapid logging operation and some substandard uh, oil palm projects happening. And we have to, and forestry is a genuine and viable industry. We can have sustainable forestry. Many would argue that you can't, but you don't need to be just sort of doing this rip and run uh, logging type operation and claiming that you're producing, uh, developing an agricultural project. Uh, you can have plantation forestry, but we've got to do these sorts of things on relatively modest areas, providing jobs locally, not to uh, large numbers of overseas people. It's not necessary. These are not high-skilled um, jobs. They're, they're jobs driving pieces of equipment, uh, um, using uh, fairly unsophisticated pieces of equipment. It's, it's something that uneducated villagers can be doing and be trained up to, to be doing. And, uh, and there's people adapt very quickly to, to skills development if they're given an opportunity here. But we have to think about the future. Mining invariably is extractive. You, you, can't, uh, you can manage it very much better so that you manage the resource, you restore the environment, and when the mine comes to an end, you, you, you restore it, and you've hopefully in the meantime uh, de helped develop other economic opportunities and, and train the local workforce and so on. You can't m make mining non-extractive, but you can make it a, as sound an industry as possible. But an LNG and gas, well, you can minimize the impact from that because it doesn't have a big hole. It do you haven't big created a big m mine pit or anything like that. It's, it's fairly uh, v localized, so you can limit the direct environmental impact if you manage that well. 
But forestry, these sorts of extractive industries, there's no reason for them to be having a big negative impact. And, and there's every reason for Papua New Guinea to ensure that what are called the sustainable industries are... Thanks for staying tuned on Resource PNG. We'll go for a commercial break and be back with more with Mr. Paul Barker of INA. Continuing discussion with Mr. Paul Barker, Executive Director of the PNG INA, we now discuss the prospects of Rio Tinto and BHP returning to operate in PNG. Manner. Whether you're talking about fisheries, you, you don't over-exploit your tuna, you don't over-harvest your, your big-eye tuna or uh, whatever. You manage them at a sustainable rate or within a sustainable rate, and the same with, with forestry, you don't just sort of clear fell large areas and claim you're going to develop them for agriculture when you're not and you uh, and if you're doing forestry you do it on a, a genuine sustainable uh, basis meeting various standards complying with the PNG code of, of practice for that industry and we need to make sure that we have in place those codes of practice and that we apply those codes of practice and that we don't have what is happening at the moment we produce all these environmental plans that are not worth the paper they're written on, many of them. Yes, the, the responsible companies, and we know who they are, they do responsible jobs with environmental plans. They do it professionally, it takes time, they bring in professionals to examine and the inv social and environmental aspects, but these bogus ones we're seeing, they produce basically nonsense, and many of them are just photocopies of each other, then the documents go off to the Environment Department. By law, they're meant to be accessible for everyone to read, including the landowners. But in practice, you'd be very hard pressed to find any of those copies. And they disappear off somewhere. And, uh, and we're not being accountable. And we just have to wonder why and in whose interests this process is there in law, but is being completely bypassed. Why do you think these environmental plans are being bypassed? in your opinion? In my opinion, maybe I could put the question back to you as, uh, as the interviewer. I think you can imagine some of the reasons. There are strong commercial benefits from these proposals. These, many of these proposals have a very limited um, benefit to an, the landowners. They have a benefit to a small group of landowners. They have a benefit to a small group of officials, other leaders, who uh, maybe particularly when it comes to election time are looking for uh, large sums of money for facilitating their campaigns. Some of these projects are speculative projects. They don't even really know what they want to do. They just want to get hold of the resource. They want, may want to trade it to someone else who may be interested in. They know that the markets of different commodities are changing price of timber may be going up, the price of carbon, for example, may be going up. They may actually want to, to preserve that forest and, and, and make the money out of that forest um, by preserving the carbon that's in the forest. But they want to get a cut on it, when in reality, it should be the landowners who own that resource who get the main benefits. Why have these middlemen uh, claiming ownership and, and striking these deals? So there are a lot of the purpose of bypassing the system is, is basically benefits for a, a few. Because as I say, the professional companies like New Britain Palm Oil in Oil Palm, for example, they follow the land, law, the land laws, the environmental laws meticulously. Yes, they could improve their operations. Anyone could improve their operations. PNG needs to improve its standards not hold its standards where it is, and, it in, and better enforce those standards to be kept. But at the same time, we need to um, ensure that you don't have two sets of rules. The rules that are followed by the respectable companies and the rules that are followed by the backdoor operators. Because I have to say, when you have these SABLs in place, for example, it actually puts off genuine investors. Because genuine investors are not going to come in to go on a piece of land that hasn't got genuine title. 
and where they're not working genuinely with the landowners, where they know that it's, it's a deal that's been struck with, with some uh, group of middlemen, uh, with some politicians and bureaucrats and, uh, and a few landowner leaders. So it actually undermines genuine investment. And I just add on that, yes, yes. if you're coming in for a very short-term project, you can make your money fairly quickly, but if you're, and you don't really worry about the repercussions of that on the country. If you're going for a long-term project, a th you know, a 20-year agricultural project, a genuine forestry project maybe of, which requires a 30-year cycle or more, then you don't want to be doing a short circuiting. You want to follow the rules and you want to have that good relationship with the local community. So when people are going bypassing it, it's usually for very much short-term gain, and short-term gain generally means m limited gain for Papua New Guinea and, and the people of the country. How do you suggest effective implementation of these environmental plans so that they are equal? And that was Mr. Paul Barker, Executive Director of the Institute of National Affairs. When we return, we join the World Bank. Good evening to you viewers. Today we have with us uh, Mr. Philip Chan from the World Bank. He is a senior specialist in EITI, which is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Welcome Mr. Uh, Chan, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well and thank you very much for inviting me here. Mr. Chan, uh, can you let our viewers know uh, as to what EITI or Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is and how is it relevant to Papua New Guinea? Well, the, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative is, uh, well, let me go back a bit. Perhaps I should start with saying what it's not. The, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative is certainly not a conditionality or some kind of stipulation that one organization imposes on a sovereign government to, to implement or not to implement. Um, the initiative is a purely voluntary uh, standard. It's a global standard for revenue transparency uh, in countries that are rich in oil, gas, and mineral resources. Um, it is essentially a, a collective approach where governments, uh, civil society groups, industry, and international organizations work together. Um, and it is, more importantly, it is led by the government of the country that's implementing it under <coughs> the guidance of a multi-stakeholder group where you have representation from both industry and civil society as well. What it really does is provide a platform for the reporting, reviewing, and assessing of, com of payments made by companies and received by governments from extractive industry activities in a particular country. Uh, very importantly said that this initiative is for countries which are rich in natural resources, in extractive resources, and uh, Papua New Guinea is a country which is blessed with very uh, wealth of natural resources in oil, minerals, and gas. And uh, so would you, uh, 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 what in your opinion, Mr. Chan, is uh, uh, revenue transparency for the government? What do you, how does this initiative bring about revenue transparency for the government? As you mentioned, could you emphasize a little bit on that? Um, so you mean, uh, how does it work? How does it work, yeah. How does it work? Well, as I said, the initiative works by, by the companies. For companies, for example, uh, they agree to publish what they pay to the government. Uh, and when I say publish, it, it, this information is actually released into the public domain. And governments, on the other hand, agree uh, to also publish what they have received from companies. So what happens there, once this information has been received and, and put out into the public domain, um, a multi-stakeholder group, it, which is, as I said earlier, composed of civil society government and industry, uh, goes through a process where they will hire an independent auditor or reconciler to look at these figures and see if perhaps if there are discrepancies. If there are discrepancies, um, this, this, this auditor or the reconciler will provide recommendations on how these should be addressed. But the important thing is that once this process is completed, this, this uh, reconciliation process is actually completed, um, a report is, is released 
publicly again. But it's also released in, in a, a very accessible manner. And when I say accessible, I mean that it's, it's released in language that people can understand, not simply very technical financial or accounting language. But it, it, the idea is to make this information accessible to the citizens, to all citizens of Papua New Guinea, so they can review this information. They can have a dialogue with the government or, 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 or industry about it, or even have a debate and say, well, where's the money? What do you, you know, how much is it? Why, why is there a discrepancy? Or something like that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chan, for pointing out that the initiative brings about uh, transparency uh, within the government. Uh, it brings about uh, transparent information about the revenues the government has received or will be receiving from the uh, extractive industries. Uh, when, when we were doing some research, uh, Mr. Chan, we understood that there are 12 countries in the world which are uh, compliant, mm -hmm. and there's some 23 other countries which are, uh, are candidate countries for this uh, initiative. Um, uh, where, where does Papua New Guinea stand in this? <clears throat> okay, so maybe let me just go back a bit. So actually there are, there are about 60 countries uh, right now in, in the world. Uh, and if you compare that to 100, approximately 199 countries, yeah. it's a lot of countries. So 60 countries actually involved in the EITI process itself. So 35 of these countries are actually implementing the initiative globally. Uh, 14, not 12 actually, because mm -hmm. just recently two, two other countries have become compliant, Peru and, and Mali, I believe. But so we have 14 countries that are actually compliant. And what that means is that they've actually gone through the first cycle of reporting. On, on revenue transparency in their country. So these include, for example, Peru, Norway, uh, Mali, Nigeria, Azerbaijan, Mongolia, um, and a few other countries. Um, the balance of these countries, of these, these 60 or, uh, that I've been speaking about, are, are, are in the process of either producing the first or second report, producing the first report, working towards becoming a candidate of EITI, or like Papua New Guinea is actually, we're actually in dialogue right now to understand it. So. The, the government of Papua New Guinea has uh, committed to looking at this initiative in a very constructive manner and also to include uh, in this process civil society and industry to, to, to work to figure out, okay, so what are the, what are the challenges that, that this country might face in implementing an initiative like that? But also, uh, more importantly, what are the benefits it's going to attain by actually doing this? Uh, you, went, you mentioned uh, about the benefits, and this is where uh, we are heading to in our next question, uh, Mr. Chan. Uh, could you emphasize uh, that in, in implementing this initiative, what benefits uh, will it bring for the government of uh, Papua New Guinea and for the people of the country? Sure. I think, um, I think the importance of the initiative, uh, uh, particularly uh, the, the importance of the initiative and, and its potential benefits uh, are, are quite uh, uh, resident now, given the current uh, reform process that the government has undertaken uh, in the country. Um, if you look around today in Papua New Guinea, it is clear that there is the, the country is on the cusp of another resource boom, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one that I, I think preceded that was in the 90s, right? But this is a new resource boom, and and I think perhaps it, the, the 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 environment or the the thinking right now, particularly in government, is, is best encapsulated by what uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Peter O'Neill, said uh, when he presented the, the legislation for the uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, to Parliament, and where he said that this is a, 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 a motion or, or the reforms that we are undertaking right now has the objective uh, to, to protect or to preserve uh, the windfalls or the revenues or the monies that will be uh, gained from these projects. For example, right now, uh, in, in Papua New Guinea, you have a major investment, and one of the biggest investments I think that ExxonMobil is doing globally, which is, uh, I mean, between 15 to 18 billion dollars, and which will triple uh, Papua New Guinea's uh, GDP. In addition to that, I mean, down the road, and within the next two to three years, you have uh, three other major uh, mining projects, Yandera, Wafigolpu, and Frida projects, which are themselves are over uh, I think $400 million in investments uh, each. So there's a lot of, uh, of revenue that will be coming here. So Mr. O'Neill, what he was saying, he was saying, listen, we need to protect uh, this windfall and we need to invest it in, in a sound manner. And I, I think the words he uses is, is to uh, preserve or to secure, which I, found, which I found really nice. He said, he said the idea here is to really to secure the future of PNG's children, which is a very important and positive thing. So in, in terms of EITI, if 
if EITI, and EITI works best when it's coupled with other reform processes, particularly in terms of financial management and anti-corruption issues. So if EITI is, is actually coupled to the Sovereign Wealth Fund, it can, for example, the, the initiative will be able to provide clearly uh, for citizens of Papua New Guinea uh, information on investments, how much investments are being made, what's the, how much production has been done in a particular sector, for example, and what revenues flows comes out of that. It also then allows citizens of PNG to actually monitor what goes in and comes out of government in terms of revenue flows, for example. And it also provides both government and to some extent industry to demonstrate to their citizens um, what the benefits are of these investments, uh, not only in terms of the, the mineral investments and the LNG investment, but also the investments that will come out of the Sovereign Wealth Fund. To secure the future for the children of Papua New Guinea is the commitment of the government uh, towards uh, looking at this initiative, and that's, uh, that's a whole lot of rolling benefits uh, to come, which takes me to the next uh, little bit technical question, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Chan, is how long does it take to implement uh, such uh, initiative? Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, generally, the, the initiative should be implemented within two to two and a half years. Um, it is, uh, uh, and given the, the, um, the context in which it's being implemented and, and the quality of, of, of capacity, both in terms of government and civil society's capacity to engage in the process and to make this happen, and, and the willingness of industry also to be fully engaged uh, and supportive, which actually here in PNG, there is a lot of support for this, both on, on, on civil society side, Transparency International, Oil Search, Exxon Mobil, um, Newcrest, and, and even Talisman. So there is a lot of support for this. So two to two and a half years it'll take to implement. Um, and it, it really it consists of five phases. Um, and the first phase is where the government, uh, if it does decide this, it endorses the initiative. It has to endorse the initiative publicly. It says, we, the government of wherever, um, are committed to this initiative. What we would like to do, and we will, this is the second thing, they need to work uh, in a constructive and meaningful way with civil society mm -hmm. and industry. Also, third, appoint a, a, a senior leader in the government to actually help coordinate, not only within the government, but in terms of the, the multi-stakeholder group itself, this initiative, to implement the initiative. Once that is done, then the, a formal, uh, what we call a multi-stakeholder group with the three parties represented, is, is constructed, and that group uh, has to prepare a really costed and results-based work plan. That work plan goes to Oslo, where the headquarters of EITI is, and is reviewed by the board for candidacy and candidacy. From there, you have four other phases, which is the preparation phase, and that phase really helps to remove, let's say, obstacles to imp implementation. Again, as I mentioned, uh, government capacity to do this uh, in, in terms of, let's say, collecting data, for example, or, or, or collaboration among agencies, for example, uh, civil society's capacity to actually engage in a meaningful way in, in, in the initiative, and of course getting uh, all companies that have material payments to the government to be involved. But also here in, in that phase you also, it, it's the point where, you know, a terms of reference is set up and uh, uh, an independent auditor or reconciler is managed. Then you move to the disclosure phase where uh, information is disclosed, it's audited, and then the dissemination phase, the report is put out, and there you have the opportunity for uh, citizens to hold government or industry to account. So that, that is like a two, 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 two and a half year, but the, the important thing here is like once a country becomes a candidate, it, it, it opens the doors to funding from the World Bank and other agencies. For example, we have a multi-donor a multi trust fund that we help to kickstart this initiative. We put money into it to help build capacity to do communication and outreach uh, work and, and just to help move this process forward as best as it can. Mr. Chan, would I be right in saying that the World Bank would assist uh, uh, or does assist uh, countries to implement this initiative and even providing funding to implement it? Absolutely. No, th that's part of yeah, what we do. Yeah, yeah thank you. And uh, you mentioned during a conversation uh, two very important things, support from the industries and support from the government. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in saying that, you also mentioned a multi-stakeholder group. Right. Which uh, we would like to understand more in detail as to what does this multi-stakeholder group comprise of and does it, uh, mm -hmm. does it incorporate uh, the country's landowners as well? Yeah, absolutely. It, it can definitely, I mean, civil society is, is a broad term. So, I mean, it, it could include the churches, the media, um, 
civil society organizations involved in transparency issues and environmental issues. Um, landowner groups, of course. I mean, we had a workshop not too long ago um, on the second and third where landowner groups were, were represented and, and, and they were part of this whole process. So yes, landowner groups are represented. Industry um, is represented as well. Uh, the important thing is to have the right representation there, the people who represent who they represent or who they say they represent. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the important thing. So the, the stakeholder group itself is, is actually at the heart of EITI because even though it's led by the government, it is led in conjunction with industry and, and civil society groups. So what that means that decisions about implementation, we, we mentioned a work plan earlier, uh, uh, implementation of this work plan are made by the stakeholder group. So one important example, for example, <laughs> one important example, for example, um, is that one of the, the main things, that, the, or one of the first things that the stakeholder group will have to do is to de devise or design and agree on a reporting template. So a reporting template will determine what and how they will report on revenue flows. So you could either report on this on an aggregated fashion, an aggregated fashion meaning, for example, that um, you could say all gold mining companies in PNG paid this much to the government, or you could say um, Newcrest or Barrick paid this much, this company paid. So it's, it's disaggregated. So in that sense, it's a bit more transparent. So these are the kind of decisions that were made. All right? But it will also determine what is materiality, and materiality in terms of uh, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative really means w you, know, you, you can set a limit. Sometimes there are smaller companies operating in the sector, and, and the payments they make to government are not necessarily material as compared to bigger companies. Uh, so you can set a materi materiality level at, let's say, $200,000. If you pay $200,000, you need to report. So these are the sort of things that uh, the multi-stakeholder group but in general, what it does, it, it sets the strategic direction of the implementation of the initiative. That's fantastic, and it, it's, it's lovely to know that the government is taking the commitment and uh, moving ahead with the, this transparency initiative, which will benefit uh, in the long run. Uh, which, which brings me to one final question, uh, Mr. Chan, is how does this help handle the multi-level corruption in the country? Mm. Well, I think what would be good, uh, I think the important thing right now, I mean, PNG um, is, is a very, uh, the sector in PNG, the, the extractive industry here in this country is, is quite matured and it's very complicated. And, and it's further complicated um, by the, the, the legal issues around land. Um, but I, I think the important thing here that, that we should try to do or, or, or try to understand is that uh, the first thing to do is really to, to, to endorse and implement this initiative, but implement this, this initiative at a national level whereby you'll actually be looking at the flows uh, nationally. I mean, th the truth of the matter is a lot of this information is already out there. So what you'll be doing is trying to correlate them and, and report on a regular basis and then have it audited. Um, but this itself takes some capacity to do, both in, in terms of government and collection, collecting the information, disseminating the information, working with the auditors. So I, I would suggest, I, I think the best thing uh, or the more positive way to approach implementing EITI in Papua New Guinea is to, in a sense, uh, start in a basic way. Start doing this at a national level and let this initiative grow. Later on, uh, the multi-stakeholder group and the government can decide how, how far they want to take this, how deep they want to take this, and, and, and how important it is to take it deeper or not. So. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chan, for this uh, very informative session on uh, Transparency Initiative, which will uh, bring a lot of benefits for the country in the long run. We thank you for your time and visiting us on the Source PNG. Well, thank you very much. Happy to be here.